In this video, we're going to learn how to use the QData structure in the C++ standard template library. So the QData structure is what's called a first in, first out data structure. What that means is the first element into the queue is going to be the first element out of the queue. So for example, if we have a queue and we insert five, we call this pushing or on queuing the element onto the queue. Now, if we push another element onto the queue, it's going to go on to the back of the queue. So if we push six onto the queue, we would have six and then five. If we push seven onto the queue, we would have seven and then six and then five. Where this here is the back of the queue and this here is the front of the queue. So right now, five is at the front of the queue and seven is at the back of the queue. So just like how when a new person enters a grocery store line, they begin at the back of the grocery store line, when new elements are pushed onto the queue, they become the new back of the queue. So if we push eight onto this queue, we'll have eight as the new back of the queue, then we'll have seven, six and five, and five is still the front of the queue. Now, just like how the person at the front of a grocery store line is going to be the next person to leave the grocery store line, the element at the front of a queue is going to be the next element to be removed from the queue. So we call removing an element from a queue, popping or dequeuing the element. So if we pop an element from this queue, what we'll do is remove five, and then six will become the new front of the queue. Then if we pop another element, six is going to be removed, and then seven will be the new front of the queue. We would say this queue has a size of two because right now there are two elements in the queue. If the size of the queue is zero, we would say the queue is empty. Now a queue data structure will typically include operations which allow us to access the elements at the front of the queue and the back of the queue. C++ includes support for both operations. Now queues are very common in computer programming. So for example, we could represent a list of printer jobs to be done using a queue. Now in C++, the queue data structure is what's called a container, more specifically an adapter container. What that means is the elements of a queue are really going to be stored in a different data structure behind the scenes, like a list or a double-ended queue. And the queue is really like an interface which is made to behave like a queue, but really the data is stored in that sort of background data structure. Let's create a queue in C++ to store int values. The first thing we'll do is include the queue library. So up here we'll have number sign include and queue. Then down here we'll declare a queue object with queue and then int and we'll have numbers here. So this will declare a queue object to store int values called numbers. Now initially the queue is going to be empty and the queue will have a size of zero. Let's test that. So the queue object has a method called size and size is going to return the number of elements in the queue. We could output this. We'll have here C out and then size colon and we'll output the return value of calling the size method followed by an inline. And there's also an empty method, which is going to return true if the queue is empty. So we'll test that too. We'll have here, if numbers.empty returns true, then we'll output here, the queue is empty. So we'll have C out and then Q is empty, followed by an inline. And now if we save compile and run the program, we'll get that the size of the queue is zero and that the queue is empty both of which are correct. Now what we could do is push our first element onto the queue and we could use the push method to do this. So down here we'll have numbers dot push to call the push method and we'll pass it the value eight and the value eight is going to be pushed onto the queue as the first element of the queue. So now our queue should have a size of one. We'll output the size again. So we'll have C out and then we'll output size colon, followed by numbers.size, followed by an inline. Now the queue should not be empty. Let's check for that. We'll copy this. And down here we'll have this time, if not numbers.empty. 
So if the method returns false, then we're going to output Q is not empty. So now if we save compile and run the program, we'll get here. Our Q now has a size of one and the Q is not empty. Now, because eight is the only element in the queue, eight is at the front of the queue and eight is at the back of the queue. We can check this using the front and back methods, which are going to return the elements at the front and back of the queue. So here we'll output front colon, and then we'll call numbers.front, which is going to return the element at the front of the queue, followed by an inline. Then we'll output back colon, followed by calling numbers.back to output the element at the back of the queue, followed by an inline. Now, if we save compile and run the program, we'll get here, the element at the front of the queue is eight, and the element at the back of the queue is eight, which makes sense because eight is the only element in the queue. Let's push some more elements onto the queue. So right now we have eight on the queue. Next, let's push nine onto the queue. So we'll have numbers dot push nine to push nine onto the queue. And so we'll have nine followed by eight. We could also push five onto the queue. So we'll have numbers dot push five. This will give us five on the back of the queue, followed by nine, followed by eight. So right now we have five at the back of the queue and we have eight at the front of the queue. So let's call the front and back methods again to verify this. Down here, we'll copy and paste this and we'll output front and back again. And I'll just put an end line here for some vertical spacing. And let's also output the size because the size should now be three. So down here, we'll have C out and then size colon and we'll call the size method with numbers.size followed by an inline. So if we save compile and run the program, we'll get here, the front is eight, the back is five, and the size is three, which is what we expected. Now to pop an element from the queue, we can use the pop method. The pop method is not going to return the element. It's only going to remove the element. So down here, we'll have numbers.pop. And what this will do is remove eight here at the front of the queue. So if we open the front back and size of the queue, we'll find that nine is the new front of the queue and the size of the queue is now two. Let's try that. We'll copy this and paste it after popping the element from the queue. So now we'll save compile and run the program. And we get here, the new front of the queue is nine, the back is five, and the size is two. So again, we got back what we expected. Now because pop does not return the element that's removed, we might wanna save that element in a variable by calling the front method first. So for example, we could have int and then popped value to declare a variable of type int called pop value. Then we'll assign to this variable the return value of calling numbers.front. So before popping and removing the element at the front of the queue, we're calling the front method to access that element and we're saving it in a variable called pop value. We could then output that previous front element down here. We could have C out and we'll have popped value colon and we'll output pop value followed by an inline. So now if we save compile and run the program, we'll see the pop value was eight, the previous front of the queue. We can also use the swap method to swap the contents of two queues. So for example, we could declare a queue to store int values called other queue. Then we'll push the value, let's say four onto this queue. So we'll have other queue dot push and then four. So right now this queue only has one element, but the numbers queue has two elements. Let's open the size of these two queues. Then let's swap them using the swap method. Then we'll output the size again. So the first thing we'll do is output the size of the other queue and the numbers queue. 
So we'll have C out and then an end line for some vertical spacing. We'll output here numbers size colon followed by the size of the numbers queue. Then we'll output other queue size followed by calling the size method of the other queue followed by an end line. Then we'll call the swap method. So we'll have other queue dot swap and we'll pass in numbers and this will swap the contents of the two queues. Then we'll output their size again. So we'll copy this and paste it and we'll output their size after. So now if we save compile and run the program, we'll see that before the swap, the number size was two and the other queue size was one. But now the number size is one and the other queue size is two. So the queues have been swapped. Now, if we use the assignment operator to assign one queue to another queue, the elements of that queue are going to be replaced by the elements of the other queue. So for example, we'll declare a queue to store in values called X and we'll push the values four, five, and six onto this queue. So we'll have x.push4, x.push5, and x.push6. Then we'll also declare a queue to store in values called y. And we'll push onto this queue the value one. So we'll have y.push1. Then if we have y is equal to x, then the elements of y are going to be replaced by the elements of x. So y will now contain the elements four, five, and six. We could output the size of y and the front element of y to see this. So we'll output here y size colon, followed by calling the size method, followed by an inline. Then we'll also output here y front colon, followed by calling the front method, followed by an inline. Then if we save compile and run the program, we'll see that y has a size of three and the front element of y is four, which is correct. Now we can also use the comparison operators with queues, for example, to check if two queues are equal or not. Let's try that. Here, we'll change this to y push four, and we'll also push on five and six. So we'll have y dot push five and y dot push six. So now these queues contain the same elements in the same order. Let's check if these queues are equal. Well, here, if x is equal to y, then we'll output x is equal to y. So we'll have x is equal to y followed by an inline. So if we save compile and run the program, we'll get that x is equal to y. Let's try to make the queues not equal. So for example, what if y has five at the front followed by four? Now these queues are not really equal due to the order of the elements. Let's check if x doesn't equal y and we'll output here x doesn't equal y. So if we save compile and run the program, we do get here that X does not equal Y. So we can also use the comparison operators with queues. Now we can also store objects in a queue. Let's define a class up here. We'll make a class for representing students. We'll have class and we'll have student and student objects will have a single public member variable of type int called grade we'll define a constructor function, which will accept a grade as an argument. And what we'll do is set the grade member variable equal to this grade. Then we'll also output a line of text to acknowledge the constructor has been called. So we'll have C out and then constructor called colon followed by the grade followed by an end line. Then we'll create a copy constructor where the copy constructor is called to create a copy of the student object. So we'll have student and we'll have const student and student as the parameter. So our parameter is a reference to a student object and we'll make this student object a copy of that object. So we'll have this grade is equal to that student objects grade member variable. Then we'll also output here that the copy constructor has been called. So we'll have C out and copy constructor called and we'll output the grade followed by an inline. Then 
down here, we'll create a queue to store student objects. So we'll have, let's say, queue student classroom. So here we've created a queue called classroom to store student objects. Then we'll create a student object called Joe with a grade of, let's say 90. Then we'll push Joe onto the classroom queue. So we'll have classroom dot push and then Joe. So now if we save compile and run the program, we'll find that the constructor is called with constructor called 90. But we'll also find the copy constructor has been called. So when we push Joe onto the queue, at that point, the copy constructor is called to create a copy of that object. So be aware of that behavior. The constructor was called to create this object here. Then when we push the object onto the queue, the copy constructor is called to create a copy of the object. We might not want to call two constructors. We may only want to call one constructor. For example, if the object may only need to exist on the queue, we can use the emplace method to achieve this. So the emplace method will forward the arguments it's provided to the constructor for the object to create an instance of the object for the queue. So if we have classroom and then dot in place and then 80, what this will do is create a student object with a grade of 80. If we save compile and run the program, we'll get here constructor called 80. Notice that no copy constructor is called. So now we only have one constructor being called by using the in place method. Now, right now, this object is at the back of the queue. If we call classroom.back to retrieve this object, at that point, the copy constructor will be called to give us a copy of the object. So here I could have student and I'll have student underscore copy is equal to classroom.back. We'll find the copy constructor is called at this point. So now we'll get copy constructor called 80. Now the destructor is going to be called if an object is popped off the queue. So up here, we could define a destructor. We'll have student with a tilde in front. And all we'll do is just output that the destructor has been called. So we'll have cout and then destructor called followed by the grade with this grade, followed by an inline. Then down here, let's try to pop a student object from the queue. So we'll have, let's say here, classroom.pop, and then afterwards we'll output after the pop, followed by an inline. Then if we save compile and run the program, We'll see here the destructor is called when that object at the front of the queue is popped. Then we output after the pop. Then when the main function itself is done, we'll see the destructor is called for the remaining object on the queue, as well as the student objects in the main function as well. So this is how we can use the queue container defined inside the C++ standard template library. Check out PortfolioCourses.com, where we'll help you build a portfolio that will impress employers.